What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas, representing Big Dogs Gotta Eat, BDGE, Fantasy Football. If you're joining us on YouTube, if you're joining us via the podcast, what's good? How you doing? It's week 10. It is Thursday. And you know we do the bi-weekly trade targets video. However, this will probably be the final one, final episode of this column, video series, whatever you want to call it, uh, because... The standard trade deadline in Yahoo, I'm not actually sure what it is in these other leagues, so if you're in a, an ESPN league or, I don't know, Flea Flicker or Sleeper Bot or whatever, let me know when your trade deadline is, but the very vast majority of the leagues that I play in are Yahoo, and the trade deadline, unless your commissioner manually changes it, is set to finish, be donezo, this Saturday. So if you're watching this, on th I'm filming this on Tuesday. So if any weird shit happens from now until Thursday, I apologize for the, the off analysis. But it will be two days from when you're watching this at 11.59 p.m. So you have until 11.59 Saturday night to make some swaps to upgrade your team or forever hold your peace. So this will be the last of the episode series, I believe. I'll figure out what we're doing from then on afterwards. If you have any good video ideas, content ideas that you want to see on Thursdays from now on. I might just go back to doing the normal Q&A weekly that I've been doing. Um, but otherwise, let me know what you want to see. Drop a comment down below. While you're down there, I would love a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. But let's get cracking on some trade targets. Now, as we usually do, we break these into buy low. We break these into sell high candidates. Uh, today, I have three buy low candidates for you. I have two sell highs, so not a crazy amount of people, but I don't always see the opportunity. So I'm not just going to make a list of four or five guys um, for no reason, unless I actually see a good buying opportunity for them. First on this list, this is an intriguing one because I see this name tossed around in the buy low or sell high list. He's been on this list almost every week of other people's, other analysts lists um, consistently from the beginning of the season. This is David Johnson, running back of the Arizona Cardinals. Now, I had never wanted to move him. I own him in multiple places. I wanted to see what kind of transpired in this offense, you know, as things were moving around and whatever. The schedule got easier, worse, blah, 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 blah. He's been on both sides of the spectrum here. Now, for this video, I outdid myself. I made y'all some fancy-ass charts, and we're going to break down the remaining schedule because buy low and sell high can take a lot of different effects or factors when you're trying to decide who you want to buy or who you want to sell, right? In the middle, in the beginning, in the middle of the season, I would say schedule plays a lot less of a factor than at the end of the season, like right now, when you're looking to go into the playoffs. You also know a lot more about teams and their defenses and, and offenses as well. So it's easier to base things on schedule, whereas in the middle of the season, you might base things on um, usage and players getting more snaps as the season goes on and injuries and things like that. So, with David Johnson, this is really the only point that needs to be made. Looking at his remaining schedule, this is a nice, cute-ass little chart, right? I worked hard on this one, man. If y'all think this is pretty, can you at least give me a thumbs up for making this pretty? Even if you think David Johnson sucks, because he, he honestly does. He sucks. I'm only putting it on here just to make myself feel better. But, remaining schedule, man. I broke this down into three different columns, and I did this with all the players on these lists. We are looking at, each week, his opponent. We are looking at in the first column, fantasy points allowed. That is whatever defense he is going against, the fantasy points allowed to that position. So for instance, Kansas City in week 10 has allowed the single most fantasy points to the running back position. So anything in green on this chart means it's a good matchup, a very good matchup for David Johnson. The second column, FODVOA, is football outsiders DVOA, which is basically their efficiency metric. Now football outsiders is... A uh, free website, a free tool for you guys to use if you want to. Just go to Football Outsiders and you can find their DVOA for any running backs, quarterbacks, pass defense, rush defense, whatever. The third column is the PFF run defense grade. So pro football focus in terms of how good the opponent's run defense is because we see a lot of drastic differences between these three columns depending on the subjective grading and fantasy points allow sometimes does not tell the story of how good a defense actually is. So that's what we're basically going off of here. And as you can see, it's just an absolute cake schedule. The only piece of schedule on here that's even like remotely bad is you see the Rams in week 16 where they have a good PFF run grade. However, like the Chiefs, the Raiders, the Chargers have not been good against the run. Green Bay, 
Detroit, Atlanta. Like, it's all, 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 all plus matchups. And even the Rams haven't been that good, but I expect their defense to kind of have a turnaround once Tlaib gets back and they start clicking a little more. But that's all the way looking to the chip. And, you know, the week 16 is championship week for the majority of, of leagues. Week 15 is the semifinals for most, for most leagues. I put extra semi chip week because some people play in larger leagues. If you play in a 12 or 14 team league, some teams have the bye. The one and two seats have the bye. So the first round is in week 14, meaning that's the semi-semifinals, if y'all know what I mean. So really just looking at this is, is the fact that David Johnson has it, it, by far the easiest schedule for running backs from this point forward. What I also like is that they're coming off their bye. And since they just replaced the offensive coordinator with Byron Leftwich, and we saw David Johnson running out wide a little bit, I think this bye week, I'm not really one that buys into the whole bye week theory about like, oh, they're coming off their bye week, they're well rested, all that kind of shit, whatever. But I do like the fact that Leftwich will have now two weeks to prepare um, on how to use David Johnson for the season going forward. So David Johnson is the first one on my buy low list simply because the schedule is just really, 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 really good. Second guy on this buy list is Aaron Jones, running back of the Green Bay Packers. This is a tough one because I was he was in such a good spot in week nine to have a big game, man. They played against the Patriots and you knew they were going to have to score points and you knew they were going to try to establish the run. And they did. And Aaron Jones played well for the most part. However, he has been out carrying Jamal Williams pretty significantly over the last few weeks, outplaying him a lot more snaps than Jamal Williams has. And of course, Ty Montgomery is gone now. So that opens up passing work to just those two guys. So even if Aaron Jones is the two to Jamal Williams is one in the passing work, Aaron Jones is still going to see three four targets a game, most likely. And the problem with last game was he lost that key, key fumble at the end of the game. And a lot of people were going to be like, oh my God, there it goes. Aaron Jones had a chance to really run away with the job. And then he fumbled in a really key situation. However, that is his first career NFL fumble that he's lost. Um, so I'm not going to look too deep into it. I'm looking at the schedule here. And again, mwah, it's beautiful. It's not crazy. Um, it's not crazy easy. There are a couple tough matchups on there. Um, at Seattle, at Minnesota, and at Chicago are actually three really tough matchups. But he also has three really, really, really good matchups. So he has Miami this week, Arizona, and Atlanta at home, back-to-back -back in weeks 13 and 14. Um, so it's a mix of good and bad. And I think he will be someone who can, you could really use in those games in which, you know, it, it's a really, really good schedule. But when I'm looking at the remaining schedule, the opponents have a combined record of 28 and 30. The key here is that they clearly want to use Aaron Jones above Jamal Williams in terms of the pecking order for running the ball. So Aaron Jones is someone who's going to really, 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 really benefit from games in which the Green Bay Packers are leading. If they go down, that's what concerns me, right? If they're down 21 points, 14 points or whatever, that is when you'll probably see more of Jamal Williams because he is, quote unquote, the better pass blocker. And he does get just as involved in the passing game as Aaron Jones, which kind of sucks because it limits Jones's ceiling that m people might have thought he had coming into the season, which clearly I don't think he has it here. But Jones is the superior runner by fucking any stretch of the ima imagination. So when you look at Jones, what you need from him is good game script. And the combining records of these teams going forward is 28 and 30. I don't see Green Bay getting completely outplayed by any of these teams. The toughest matchup they will have is Week 12 at Minnesota. They're going to be they're going to be underdogs there, and they probably will have to catch up. But if you're looking at Miami, I don't think Seattle's that much better of a team on the road. I think it'll probably be like a two or three point favorite. Definitely will be favorites at Arizona or against Arizona. Atlanta, Green Bay should be a good game. Even at Chicago in Week 15, I wouldn't necessarily say that Green Bay. They're definitely not going to be in catch up mode, is what I'm saying. Only because. Chicago, while while they might be underdogs, Chicago is not a team that's going to run away on offense from the Packers. Um, and then the Jets, the Green Bay Packers will definitely be favored in that game. So I think Jones benefits most from having good game script um, than anything else. So I, I'm not really concerned about the matchups as much as I am, you know, what's going to transpire in those games. And we know Aaron Jones is really good. We know he's a great runner. We know he is super efficient. He just needs the volume. And I think as long as the games stay in focus, then the volume will come. And I think we're seeing... Um, you know, the, the scales tip more towards Aaron, Aaron Jones, and we're going to see it more and more as we go down the stretch. We haven't seen him get that big, like, 20, 22, 25 carry game yet, but I think a couple of those are are on their way. And uh, I think Aaron Jones is a very good buy-low candidate considering people got high about him in this previous week, and then he kind of disappointed. So I think now is a, is, a good time to, um, is a good time to buy Aaron Jones. Last guy on this list is a wide receiver. I know a lot of you guys have been asking me about, you know, like who's a wide receiver that I can trade for right now, wide receiver two. And I think a really good buy low candidate right now is actually Juju Smith-Schuster of the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
Now, I'm not even going to put his schedule on here because it's not necessarily great. He'll have a few tough matchups, um, but he has a few good ones. Kind of kind of similar to Aaron Jones here. He gets Carolina in Week 10, who have allowed the most fantasy points to slot, slot wide receivers in 2018 per PFF. Um, and then his playoff matchups are really, really good, too. He plays New England, and he plays the Saints. Um, New England is allowing the fifth most fantasy points to slot wide receivers. The Saints are allowing the single most fantasy points to opposing wide receivers overall in the year. So it's two games in which they are absolutely going to need to score a lot of points. And I expect big production from Ben as well as his offense, um, which of course means good things for Juju Smith-Schuster. Now, Juju over the last few weeks has, has had a major slowdown in terms of his production, right? Because he started off so hot and you're like, damn, Juju, sign, Juju greater sign Antonio Brown, right? AB was like at ease, at ease brothers, and he's been fucking nuts the last few weeks. Opposite, Juju has kind of cooled off. What I would say to that is like this this is kind of how I see or why I think this this kind of stuff happened. I think it's always more of a mental game when people are like, oh, he's not doing too well, like he he's not the same player he was. I would say like Juju dropped a really, 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 really easy ball last week in week nine. Um, they hit him in the hands. It, it was a it was a focus drop, something that doesn't happen to Juju that often. I think had he caught that ball. He's probably looking at uh, another, you know, 100-yard game here. And that would actually make that the second 100-yard game in the last three games. So he's been perfectly usable and perfectly fine over the last few weeks. The problem is he hasn't scored a touchdown in e any of the last three games. And uh, he hasn't found the end zone since week five because there's a bye week in the middle of that, which makes it seem even worse as a Juju owner. But when you're looking at the numbers, he still leads the team in red zone targets with 19, which is second in the entire NFL. So Juju second in the NFL with 19 red zone targets on the year, only behind Alvin Kamara, who has 20. Antonio Brown has 13 red zone targets. Um, he also leads the team in 10 zone targets. So he has six targets inside the opponent's 10 yard line as opposed to Antonio Brown's five. So as we know, right, if you listen to my channel, you know touchdowns are highly, highly volatile, especially with wide receivers and are very hard to predict. But the one thing we can look at is volume and usage. Juju is clearly a big, big part of their offense when they are near the end zone. They are riding a four-game win streak. They are hot right now, and I think that continues. And I think the unpredictability of touchdowns will eventually start swinging back over into Juju's favor. He's someone who is, like I said, second in the NFL in red zone targets. He is getting more targets than Antonio Brown inside the 10-yard line. So it's very hard to imagine these things not shifting back towards uh, Juju, at least in, in a slight sense. So I, I like Juju right now coming off of, you know, three games and a bye in which the owners weren't necessarily, they're not going to be pissed about it, but you're looking at a guy like Juju who was so good in the beginning of the year that he might've cooled down and people are looking at him as maybe like a low end wide receiver too, that I think you should try to flip for. Like if you could flip Amari Cooper off of the big game on, on Monday night, not even the big game, but he looked like, okay, good. I would flip Cooper for Juju in a second. So guys like that are, you know, in the wheelhouse, Cooper and maybe like a RB2, like an Alex Collins or something like that for Juju, something I would absolutely do. So those are my three buy low guys. And before we get into my sell high, y'all should buy low on some Fantasy Jocks equipment. FantasyJocks.com, thank you for sponsoring today's video. They are the industry leader in fantasy sports, your league's gear. Whatever you need, them boys got it over there. Belts. Rings, trophies, we ain't got a trophy here, but we still stay winning. Draft boards, whatever sport you do, it doesn't have to be fantasy, fantasy football. They got belts for basketball, for baseball, whatever it is, you can get them customized. You can get this on, in my big money league. We got E-Town, Get Down, Championship, whatever, whatever, get your team's name engraved, have everyone chip in a little bit of money and get yourself a prize. It's almost playoff times, people. Use promo code TAKE10 or Taco Corp for 10% off your purchase. You gotta do it now because the season's almost over. We got a couple weeks left. I don't know how long this promo code is gonna last for. They might cut it off at the end of the year. So scoop it now. Check out fantasyjocks.com. Link will be down below. Take 10, Taco Corp, 10% off your purchase. Thank you, sirs. If you're enjoying the video, the podcast, whatever it is thus far, I would very much appreciate a thumbs up on the video. Comment down below if you have any good buy low or sell high targets that you think other people would want to know about. I got nothing else. Leave a rating and review for the podcast. It's just just help, help you mans out over here. Working hard, making these beautiful charts. Another one that I'm about to put up on your screen. So, sell high candidates. Like I said, we have two. One running back, one wide receiver. Probably both questionable. First one on this list is Carryon Johnson. Sorry, I had to have a moment of silence. Man, this one hurts. As someone who loves Carryon Johnson, been very, very, very fond of. Big Carryon Johnson fan. 
and I wish it wasn't a good idea to trade him, but I'd be lying to myself, I'd be lying to y'all if I didn't say that it was a good idea to trade him. Because his schedule from this point forward is brutal. He gets Chicago twice over the next three weeks. The number one graded pro football focus run defense, number three per football outsiders, they have allowed the single fewest amount of fantasy points to opposing running backs. So two of the next three games are against Chicago. Uh, Khalil Mack should be back. If he's not back for this first one, then he definitely will be, at, be back for week 12. And you look at the only two games in which you would consider easy games, Arizona and Buffalo, and they are actually, while they are easy opponents in terms of game script, both of them are on the road, which is not good. Um, and at the same time, they've allowed a lot of fantasy points, but when you look at it from an efficiency standpoint, like per football outsiders, both of them are top 13 run defenses. Arizona's 13th, Buffalo is 12th. So it's like even like his really easy games are not necessarily super, super easy. You know what I mean? So it's like Chicago, Carolina has been really good against the run. The Rams have been good. Minnesota is his championship week. So it's like it's a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of tough games for carry on going forward. Um, it's not just a schedule, though. If it was just a schedule, I would say, you know what, I'll probably hold on to carry on Johnson and let him ride out as like a low end RB2. The other concern is obviously him getting back into a timeshare when Theo Riddick is healthy, and he is now. I want you to take a look at this chart that I made. From weeks one to six, week six was the bye. Riddick played, so from weeks one to five, really, Riddick was healthy. Carry on Johnson played on an average 43% of the team snaps week over week. In the two games without Theo Riddick, so it was week seven and eight. He played on 70% of the team's snaps. And you would think, given how good he did in that time span, you know, that would kind of separate himself from the pack and they would start utilizing him more as a featured three down back. And I think, like, deep down as a carry on Johnson owner, I was like, yeah, I hope that happens. But, like, I really knew Theo Riddick was going to come back and they were just going to continue to use him how they had used him and they don't care about using carry on Johnson as a feature role because they don't care about fantasy football. And that's one of the other takeaways is you have to think that coaches are not going to be rational. That's how the NFL works. They don't care about fantasy football. They don't care about what you think or I think. He played in 70% of the snaps without Theo Riddick. Theo Riddick returns in week nine. They split the backfield. 39 snaps apiece. 50-50 split evenly. What's more concerning Right or what? What you would have wanted to see was Carryon's involvement in the passing game a little bit more. His routes run per game, right? So if he's playing in the backfield, I don't really necessarily care about the snap percentages if the touches are there or if he's running a lot of routes, right? So from weeks one to five, he ran a route. He ran thirteen point four routes a game, which were thirty three percent of the team's total dropbacks. So uh, you know, one out of every three dropbacks, Carryon Johnson is on the field running a route. Week seven and eight, with Theo Riddick out, his routes run went up from 13.4 to 20 and a half routes a game. 60% of Stafford's dropbacks, Karen Johnson was out running a route. If you look at the box score, you would say, oh, you know what? He had five targets and three receptions. Like, that's pretty good. You would take that. Someone who's going to be the clear runner in this offense, right? The guy who's going to get the most carries. And then if he's going to get three to four catches a game, that's perfectly fine. However, not that it was an outlier, but they threw the ball a ton. They threw the ball, uh, he dropped back 49 times. So this was more of a game script and the volume dictated that. Because if you look at it from a percentage standpoint, right? He ran 19 routes in the game, which is how many routes he ran when Theo Riddick was out. However, that was only a route run on 39% of Stafford's dropbacks. So it's much closer to the percentage of routes run on in terms of dropbacks two weeks, one through five, when Riddick was on the field than when he wasn't. So it's not like, it is a 6% increase, and obviously you're going to see a little bit of volatility when it's only a one-game sample size, but it's just telling you that Theo Riddick is the one, clearly, as the pass catching back. He ran 29 routes in this game. Theo Riddick had 29 routes run compared to Carryon Johnson's 19 in this one. So he's clearly still the back who is running the most routes out of this backfield. Now, with Golden Tate, you know, moving over to Philly, a lot of people are getting excited saying, oh, Theo Riddick's going to move into the slot more, which means Karen Johnson will occupy the backfield more. Now, that is the case, but Theo Riddick still, he had 25 snaps in the backfield. He had eight snaps in the slot, which is encouraging as a Karen Johnson owner. However, however, they did just sign Bruce Ellington. And I am one person that thinks Bruce Ellington is a good slot receiver. He was good in the very limited time he had with the Texans, and he's been good in his NFL career when he stays healthy. So if Bruce Ellington is healthy, which he is now, he will occupy that slot role by Golden Tate in this Detroit offense, which means Theo Riddick will not 
be used in the slot as much as you know we kind of had thought after the Golden Tate trade. So it's just a lot working against him. And of course, you know, LeGarrette Blunt is still there and he's still going to get goal line carries. He has outcarried Karrion Johnson three to one on the goal line this year. So Karrion Johnson is still very, 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 very much in a running back by committee. And the only way he's getting out of it is through injury. So that's what I have to say about that. Second person, second player, last player on this buy low, sell high list is Tyler Boyd, wide receiver of the Bengals. Hear me out. This is going to be also questionable. And to be honest with you, I don't really know what to do with Tyler Boyd. But I think my point here is to test before you're like, oh my God, AJ Green is out. Tyler Boyd becomes the number one. This is awesome. I would test the market. I would test the waters out there and see what people are willing to trade for Tyler Boyd. Coming off a big game, now with the news that AJ Green is hurt for a multi-week absence, I want to know what people are willing to give up for Tyler Boyd. If you can flip Tyler Boyd for James White, if you can flip Tyler Boyd for... I don't know, like a low-end RB1, I would do it in a second. So people are going to be very high on Boyd for the rest of the season because of AJ Green's injury. Now, Green has been put on a two-week timetable. That does not mean it's a two-week timetable for him to return. He's on a two-week timetable to get reevaluated to see if he can begin doing football activities again. If I've learned anything this year about injuries, it's that you should not be optimistic about these things. I think that AJ Green is closer to a four-week timetable than a two-week timetable. Like, I would put money on him returning closer to week 14 than to week 12. But again, I'm just a doctor. So I don't know what's going to happen here. But it's, you know, it's, it's on you guys to figure out how you see things. And within the next couple of days, we might have more reports about AJ Green. I don't really know. But he's at a minimum of two weeks. And this makes me nervous to, for two reasons. Not sure what the Cincinnati offense is going to do, the coaching staff is going to do with Tyler Boyd. So he clearly becomes their best wide receiver, their best weapon overall. Um, as a pass catcher, you know, Joe Mixon's still a very good running back, of course, but I mean, Tyler Eifert's hurt, AJ Green's out, John Ross has been sucking, so he's the clear number one wide receiver as long as Green is out. The problem is if they decide to move, they can do two, one of two things. They can keep him in the slot where he's been operating from, or they can move him outside. If they move him outside, operating as a wide receiver one, it's going to be very tough. He has a lot of tough matchups ahead against cornerback ones, and we've seen wide receivers who, in this situation, right, are the wide receiver ones or are very productive from the slot, as soon as injuries occur and they have to move outside, problems occur. We saw it with Quincy Nunwa this year. We've seen it with like Randall Cobb a few years ago in Green Bay. It's like some guys are good because they are good at finding zone coverage, right? And they're good at finding the slide. It's the same way I, I bet if Antonio Brown got hurt and they had Juju Smith-Schuster running on the outside, he would not do that well because cornerback ones are very much, um, they're, they're good in man coverage. And if you're not good against press coverage and, and breaking free and getting separation that way, you're going to struggle. And a lot of slot receivers do struggle when they have to go against man and press coverage. So comes back to the fact that I'm not sure what they're going to do with Tyler Boyd. Um, John Ross is getting healthy. So if he is back in the game, I would assume that he takes over an outside role and then hopefully Boyd will stay in the slot. But if Boyd has moved to the outside and he plays against the opposite cornerback ones. This is his schedule going forward. New Orleans, at Baltimore, Cleveland, Denver, Chargers, Oakland, Cleveland. There's not an easy matchup on there outside of Oakland. So if he's on the outside, he will get Marshawn Lattimore, Brandon Carr and Jimmy Smith on the road in Baltimore, Denzel Ward, Casey Hayward, possibly Chris Harris, depending on what they do with him there. And they get the good matchup against Oakland. It's a lot of tough matchups. They get Cleveland twice, who has been... Football Outsiders, number one ranked pass defense, DVOA. The other thing is, if they keep him in the slot, look at the first column of this chart. Fantasy points allowed to slot wide receivers. So I didn't just do wide receivers, I did slot wide receivers. So if he's outside, he's playing against tough cornerback ones. If he's inside, these are defenses that have been very, very good against the slot. All of them are in the bottom half in terms of points allowed to slot wide receivers. Five of the seven are in the bottom 12. Not only is my concern about his matchups, my concern is this offense in general, right? They're going to be a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot worse without A.J. Green in that lineup. He takes away a lot of pressure on these other offensive playmakers because the defense has to give him so much attention. What I would say is like, yeah, Dalton's been good too. And I tweeted this out today that outside of elite pass throwers, a quarterback in the NFL is only going to be as good as his weapons. And, uh, and I think that goes for the other side of the spectrum as well. If you're a horrible quarterback, then yeah, you're not going to be as good as your weapons. You'll be, you know, if you're not on this end or this end of the spectrum, you'll probably be somewhere in the middle and you're only as good as your weapons. Dalton is going to be operating with his outside threats as Tyler Boyd, CJ Ozma, hopefully John Ross. We don't even know if he's healthy or not. So it's like, it's not a good situation for Cincinnati. And I'm a little nervous that this offense is kind of going to tank without AJ Green on the field. 
um, his value, test his market value. I'm not necessarily going nuts to get rid of him, but I think he's someone that you could sell high only because the value you can get for him might be very high because people think with AJ Green out, Tyler Boyd might explode over you know the next few weeks of the season. So I'm not sure I'm on that boat. And I also tweeted this out, and this is like, I love tweeting like out random controversial shit and let people like go nuts on Twitter about it. I said, like, think about it this way. Who would you rather have rest of season? Tyler Boyd or Amari Cooper? They're both the clear wide, wide receiver ones in their respective offense. They're both offenses that I don't think are going to be very good going forward. Without A.J. Green, I don't think Cincinnati's offense is going to be that well. They both have a number one stud running back that they're going to focus the ground game on. So these guys will probably be force-fed targets just from lack of other weapons on the field. So I don't think the two outlooks of those two guys are very much different. I know some people are probably be like, oh, Dak's not as good as Andy Dalton or the coaching is not as good. But yeah, sure, that, that's probably the case. But I don't think it's really that big of a gap between the two. And I think the trade value of the two is significantly different. Like if you tried to move Amari Cooper, you would not be able to get the same value in return as if you tried to move Tyler Boyd right now following the AJ Green injuries. So that's kind of my point on Tyler Boyd. Again, not someone I'm looking to get rid of, but if I could sell him for a lot of value, I like what you could probably find on the market right now. So we have David Johnson, Aaron Jones, Juju as my buy lows. We have Karrion Johnson and Tyler Boyd as my sell highs. Um, and just a couple other guys, like, I guess my opinion on Amari Cooper, I liked what I saw, and this is very much what I thought we would see, is just someone who's going to be force-fed. I mean, they gave up a number one pick for him. They don't have anyone else on the outside. They don't have a tight end that, that catches passes. Everyone else in this offense is horrible besides Zeke. So he is going to get 8, 10, 12 targets a game going forward, and um, I think by just sheer volume, he's going to be a decent wide receiver too going forward. So I kind of like Cooper. I'm not necessarily looking to sell him off right now because I don't think the, the value on Cooper is really going to be that high. I don't think the trade market's going to be that high. You'll probably need another game or two good games in a row out of him before you can do that. So uh, it might be too late at that point. A couple other guys just like name real quick that I didn't get in depth with is Jordan Howard. He's been terribly inefficient in this offense. Um, the game scripts over the last couple games have been very favorable for him and he is getting it done fantasy wise by touchdowns, but he's been ridiculously touchdown dependent. And if they're not in a good game script, then I don't think Jordan Howard necessarily has a good game. So he's someone that I would move based off the fact that he has like four touchdowns in the last three games. You might be able to move him. Um, but most people for the most part are in the same mindset that like Jordan Howard is a pretty easy sell high. The other guy that I would put on this list, and it might be a little bit surprising, is Leonard Fournette. He's finally supposed to make his return. I would not be surprised if they, well, one, they, they picked up Carlos Hyde too. So it's like, not that I think this is going to be a backfield by committee whatsoever. Like Fournette's their guy, obviously, but it's just like a lot of investment in that backfield. And it wouldn't surprise me if they, I don't know, like, I, I don't, I, I just don't, I'm not that high on Fournette right now going forward. I think they're going to like, I think they're going to throw him back into that featured role. And like, I, I it, it might just be that Fournette can't handle 25 to 30 carries a game and he's going to hurt himself again. If they push him too hard, too quick, that very, that very well might happen again. And with the rumors coming out that, you know, he is ready to go and they're not limiting him in practice. People are going to be like, okay, I got Fournette back as an RB1. You might be able to sell him high. So another guy that I'm not like necessarily looking to move, but Test the waters. I mean, that, that could be said for almost anybody. Test the waters on these guys because there is downside. What, the, the guys that you have to test the waters on in the trade value in the market are guys whose downside don't seem as obvious. Like, for instance, Tyler Boyd. People all, all people only see upside with Green's injury. Fournette, they see him returning fully healthy finally. They don't see the downside of rushing him back and him getting hurt again. So I think the guys who you have to test the market for are the guys who have obvious, very high upside, but also underlying downside like an underlying floor in case like bad things happen so those are guys i would look out for um leonard fournette in terms of dalvin cook definitely not a definitely not a sell high guy he is a, a he's not even going to be a buy low because anyone who owns dalvin cook has kept him up to this point you didn't drop him and you probably didn't trade him so you have kept him because you were waiting for this moment and if you've kept him up to this point and you just saw him go 10 for 89 or whatever you're not looking to sell him. You 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 held him so that he could be the featured back on a good offense in Minnesota going forward. So I don't think you're getting anything from Dalvin Cook owners, but I don't know. That's really all I got for you today. So that will wrap up the video. If you uh, if you want to see some more exclusive content from your mans, you can head over to patreon.com slash BDGE where I do my weekly rankings, where I do a private live stream that will take that already took place last night. If you're watching this on Thursday, uh, very intimate. So it's only like 10 or 20 people in the private live stream, patrons only, um, where I answer like all of your questions. 
So you can check out patreon.com slash BDGE for more info on that. That's really, uh, that's really all I got. So if you enjoyed, if you found this valuable, leave a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you are new. Comment down below if you've pulled off any trades, if you were finessing MFs. The last couple of weeks, I want to hear some of the good trades that y'all pulled off because some of you guys play in leagues where I don't know where you find these league mates, bro. I really don't know where you find them. Some of these trades that you guys send me are fucking out of control. That's all I got to say for you. That's that's my parting words, and I'll, I'll see y'all on Saturday for my top DFS plays.